So what we're going to do this weekend is we're going to spend time looking forwards. We're going to be gazing into the future. We're going to be using the scripture to to help us picture the return of our King and, and the way that His return is going to irrevocably change the world. We're going to look at the 50 years that that follow his return, our next 50 years from the day of his arrival. And then after that, we're going to try and look at the thousand years that follow that. And then after that, we'll be close to running out of time for our weekend. And look, it's a really quote heavy section to look at. There are so many passages to go through and we've got to fly through this great wealth of detail for along with the subject of the work of Jesus Christ, this subject, the subject of the things around the kingdom of God, those are the two pillars of the gospel, aren't they? The things concerning the name of Jesus Christ, pillar one, the things concerning the kingdom of God, pillar two. And and so this, this subject is in almost every chapter of the Bible in some way or other, every story, every life. So we've got a lot of ground to cover over a thousand years of history. And the first 50 years of that history will be the most momentous and turbulent and transformative in all history. All of history up till now, nothing has come close to the next 50 years. And I know that not everyone finds prophecy easy. Um, I'm pretty sure some here uh, we'll find the material we cover hard going. Uh, you might even find yourself switching off and perhaps drifting for a moment or two. After all, it is, it's Friday evening after a long week. And well, if that's you, take this as a kind of free pass. I, I understand, I get it. I, I really struggle in the epistles and I struggle with thematic studies and I, I'm, I understand. If prophecy isn't your cup of tea, that's okay. But I do have one object, one one goal for each of us this weekend. I hope that after each of our sessions together, you're going to be able to find something, just, just one thing, one detail, one piece of material that you can use to embellish your vision of the future, that each talk we cover will have at least one thing that you can use as as pigment to paint your vision. Because vision's so important. It's so necessary. The, The world we sojourn in, it's so invasive, isn't it, brothers and sisters? We all know this. It's so exhausting. It's so corrosive. It's like death by a thousand cuts. And all of us come here and we bear these wounds and and the road ahead seems so steep and so rocky. If we can't close our eyes and and visualise that that longed-for future, our strength is going to falter. The world's venom is going to poison our veins. We need an antidote and, and this is one. Without a vision, we will get lost in the dark. But with one, we can keep our fire alight no matter what comes. Uh, I don't really like sportsman quotes, but this one, there's a couple here that I I really thought fit. This is Emil Zapotec. Sorry, Zeta. I can't even pronounce it. It's Friday. I can't say his name. Someone else can have a go at that later. But he was a Czech runner Many believed to be the greatest of all team, of all time. He was the winner of the gold in the 5,000 meters at the uh, 1952 Olympics. And then he was the winner of the 10,000 at the 1952 Olympics. And then having won those two golds, he thought, you know what? I've never run a marathon in my life, but maybe I'll give it a try while I'm here. And he won gold in that as well. And he said, an athlete cannot run with money in his pockets. He must run with hope in his heart and dreams in his head. And I think that's so true for us. We we need to have a vision of the future. 
Michael Jordan, who probably very obscure, most of you won't have heard of this, this guy, but he said that um, his vision of glory motivated him to push past weariness and, and difficulty. And so I hope that I hope that each of us can transform something in each session from, from something that maybe is a bit academic into something that adds to our picture. Hopefully, each of you are going to be able to take home a bit of a, a postcard from your future. Personalise it. it it's, not, it's not my vision. It's, it's hopefully going to become your vision. And one other little matter of, of housekeeping before we dive right in, I'm aware that this subject can at times be just, just a touch controversial. And uh, of course, I'm, I'm going to do my level best to, to share with you the things I learned from, from studying this subject. But look, it might be that there's some things I get wrong. <laughs> now, if something I say during this weekend starts a spirited debate, you know what? I'm, I'm going to take that as a win. Um, because, you see, we only emotionally invest enough to argue about subjects that we really care about. And if we're all arguing about something Brother Dan said about the kingdom, whew, we're invested and that's fantastic. I'm happy to talk about the bits that you might disagree with and we might agree and I might change what I say or we might agree to differ. Mostly it's not a problem because... You know, while most of what I present, I really hope is you're going to see is well-founded and based on unambiguous scriptures. If it turns out that I just happen to be wrong about the colour of the steps leading into the temple, they're going to be green, by the way. Well, when we're both standing on those steps, you can come up to me and say, I told you so, and it'll be okay. So we won't get too worried. Come and tell me if you disagree and we can talk about it. So let's get started. When, whoa, sorry, wrong question. We're not going to deal with the when particularly, but let's start with the what. What will our beloved Lord's return be like? Well, there's one phrase that shows up again and again and again. And hopefully some of you are thinking it, you're mouthing it because you know it's, it's like a thief, like a thief. This passage, Revelation 16, verse 15, it's possibly the, the best known of those thief quotes, although there are lots of others. I'll put some of them below for you if you're interested. And you see, he comes as a thief, not to the world, but to the saints. Now, looking at that passage, you think about it, they don't have garments to keep clean out in the world. This isn't written to the world. This is written to, to us. He's saying to us, I will be thief-like. And in fact, this one particular passage, this always sends shivers down my spine because this passage is written to the saints at just one point in history and none of us. It's written to the saints just before Armageddon, just before the coming of Christ. That passage in Revelation 16 was not written for everybody. It was written for us. And in fact, and this is why it sends shivers down my spine, if you read through, you'll notice something weird in Revelation 16. See, it says a few verses earlier, and I, John, saw... And then he comes a few verses down and he says, Behold, I come as a thief. And you think, well, what's John coming for as a thief? Why is John coming as a thief? But you see, the speaker has changed, but no one bothered to write that down. And it's almost as if John was sitting there writing about the, the sixth vial and all the terrible things that happened before Armageddon. And he goes, oh, that's, that's really intense. That's really exciting. He gets a, a coffee break. And he comes back and someone Someone has written that verse. I come as a thief in his scroll. He goes, who, who, wrote, who wrote that? He recognises the handwriting. Our Lord wrote it. 
And he came and he wrote it. There's no introduction and straight afterwards it returns to the narrative without saying and the Lord left me or anything like that. It's just dropped into the text with no introduction because you see the Lord couldn't trust anyone else to tell us this because it was so important for you and for me. We've got to be watching, he says. And Christ said, yeah, I'm going to tell them myself. He comes as a thief. And again and again, our beloved told us watching for an unexpected return is absolutely vital. He talks to the disciples and says to them, hey, watch, disciples, watch. And then it's almost as if he turns away from them and he's looking straight at us, straight out of the Bible, almost as if he's looking straight into the camera and he's, he's looking at us and he's saying, watch what I said to them, I'm saying to you. Why? Why does he labour this point? Oh, it's because he knows, doesn't he? He knows there will be those caught unready. Not all. Not everyone's going to be caught unready. There will be good men and women watching. There will be wise virgins waiting. There's going to be some who are, who are not watching. They're not ready. He really warned us. Why, why would anyone not be ready for the coming of Christ? Well, our Lord described them in Revelation, didn't he, as, as lukewarm, blind and naked, penniless. And here's the thing, in cheerful denial of their whole situation. And you see, they've been lulled. There's some people who get lulled into this, this comfortable apathy. Perhaps it's time that does it, just wearing them down. It's been so, you know what, could be a hundred years, could be longer, they say. And yes, academically, they're right, but you can't live like that, not if you're watching. Or, or maybe they're just getting a little bit too involved in everything that this life has to offer. And there's a lot. It's an intoxicating world out there. Or perhaps it's just the stresses and strain of this strange and twisted world in which, in which we exist. Worry, behaving like a trap taking our mind into other places. We should have been watching, but we were busy worrying. And so over and over and over and over, our beloved labours his warning. He's pleading with, with all of us to be alert, to be sober, wide awake, to be ready. The night would be dark, he said. Sleep beckons all of his servants. The watchmen, all of the watchmen of the Lord, they all long for signs. We're all longing for something that we can see that'll just snap us wide awake. Oh, I'm awake now. I'm awake. I saw it. We're longing for something decisive that will jolt us into wakefulness. And yet our Lord warned. He warned that the sea would rage and that the waves would crash, that fear would grow all around the world. But but, but that once we pass that last decisive signpost, that is the recapture of Jerusalem by the Jews in the 1950s and particularly, yeah, 1950s and 60s. The roaring would grow louder after that signpost. The darkness would get darker, but we get numb to it, it all become a whole lot of the same, just more. And when he came, it would be without notice, without warning, like a thief. And that won't happen to us, will it? Because we'll be watching. So when will Christ come? And this is the point where I don't pull out dates. When in the prophetic sequence of events 
will our Lord's stealthy advent occur? And this is really important for the young people. The answer to that question is next. He comes next. And what I mean by this is is we will search in vain for other signs, other prophesied events that must occur before he comes. Oh, sure, there are things that could happen. They might happen before he comes. But there is nothing, absolutely nothing that we are waiting on before he can return. It's nothing. Oh, he can't come till this has happened. Nothing. And this is so important. It's so important that we understand this. Because if you're waiting, if we're waiting for that elusive sign You know what it is? It's it's like waiting for a a letter to slide under the door. Dear householder, I'm your local burglar. I'll be robbing your house on the 27th at 3 a.m. sharp. Please be ready with your valuables on the front table. Who does that? Thieves do not do that, and our Lord will not do that either. And if we had that, we wouldn't need to watch, would we? That's why he said, watch, watch, watch. Brother Thomas said this, we're not going to go through it all. It's a long piece of text, but the key part, he says, look, we do not have to await the advance of the Russian Gog against Constantinople. He's saying, don't wait till Russia invades Turkey. He says, all of the things that he's describing will have happened by the time the kingdom is established in full, yes, they won't have happened by the appearing of Jesus Christ. And he based that partly on Revelation 16, just a few verses earlier than we were, talking about the drying up of the Euphrates. That what? The way of the kings of the sun's rising might be made ready. And your Bible won't say that, but Brother Thomas is dead. The way of the kings of the east. Who are they? Well, what's being prepared there? It's a preparation for the saints. And, and what Christ was saying is that this preparation for the saints, well, the saints would be their way, their path, their highway would be prepared sometime before the world begins its journey to Armageddon. So the first certain event in our journey to the kingdom of God is the return of Jesus Christ. That's the first certain event from here. And and 1st of Thessalonians provides us with a description of his first actions on his arrival. The Lord descends with a shout of command with the authority of the name-bearing angel and the urgency of a trumpet call echoing across the hills, calling the dead to rise. It's just, just the same as it was with Lazarus. Remember that story? He stood outside the tomb and with a loud voice, he commanded Lazarus to arise. And so he'll answer the prayer of of thousands, hundreds of thousands of saints over the years. There will be this, to use Shakespeare, a consummation more devoutly wished for and prayed for than Hamlet could ever express. How long is the cry of the saints? It's another way of, and most of the kids here will get this, Are we nearly there yet? When will we be there? Is it time yet? That's the cry of the saints. And the answer to that is, when? How long? In the morning. In the morning. I love this passage. It is so beautiful. Isaiah 26, 19. I'm going to read the Jerusalem Bible because it just, it adds a little bit more for me. 
your dead will come to life. Their corpses will rise. Awake and exult, you who lie in the dust, for your dew is a radiant dew. The land of ghosts will give birth. What a beautiful picture. It's this picture of of things dead now emerging in radiant beauty. And when you go through the Bible and you look at Jew and you think, well, what's, what's Jew got to do? Yeah, it sounds like that. They come out of the grave and they're, they're wet and cold. <laughs> but that's, that's not what he's saying. There's this beautiful, the Jew symbolises, for those of you who remember when we did the Gideon together, it symbolises the resurrection, doesn't it? It's something that, that appears suddenly returning youth to those who had died from old age. It it speaks of life forevermore. And the only person who knows where it comes from is God. It comes in the darkest moment of the night and then then there's dawn. And and those things that that have had the dew fall upon them sparkle. They shine and they glisten. What a wonderful symbol. God's blessing, this refreshing gift drops suddenly and lightly. It's away from anything humanity can do and achieve. And as the sun of righteousness arises with healing in his beams, he reveals the mundane, humdrum brothers and sisters of old who passed away, but now they're not mundane. They're not humdrum. They are clothed in glory. And our reading, thank you for reading that. Our reading... uh, wherever you are, a reading touched on that this evening, didn't it? Daniel 12 and verse 3. Many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth will awake. Some to everlasting life. And the wise are going to shine as the brightness of the firmament. Those who are now in the dust will wake up. And and at the end of that chapter, Daniel, Daniel, the person who'd who'd endured all of the things in the book that he wrote, he was told, but go your way, Daniel, to the end. Your end will come, Daniel. It will. He would face death, but now, now he could face death with confidence. For he was told, you're going to stand again, Daniel. He would rise and in the end of days, that shout of authority would summon him too from his long sleep and Christ would be there to say, it's now, I've come, it's time to get up, to shake Daniel out of his long rest. I'm here, I'm here. Now, we don't have time tonight to to talk about um, to talk about the resurrection in any great detail it's probably uh, another study but but Daniel himself would have had a very clear picture of all that was involved in the resurrection process in fact he'd he'd had this kind of resurrection simulation that he went through he he experienced this this sort of simulated death And then he was kind of excavated, as it were, from the dust. And and then he was remade and he was strengthened and and he had this judgment process. He confessed and then there was acceptance. And finally, he was glorified in type. And and that all happened to Daniel way back at the start of this chapter. And you think, oh, it doesn't happen at the start of chapter 12. But you see, Daniel chapter 10, 11 and 12, they're all one big chapter. They are Daniel's great vision, the greatest of his vision. And it started with Daniel being resurrected from the dead in type. His one and only great vision, the vision in which the great panorama of history begins in Daniel 10 and and it finishes at Daniel 12 with with the words that Daniel was told, you will stand, Daniel. So the dead are raised first. Dead are raised first. And you know what? That's a really intriguing thought. The process of raising and judging dead believers will have 
already commenced before we, the living, are gathered. How long before? Well, we're not told. And do you know what that means? That means it's possible. I'm not saying it's a fact, but it is possible that even now, a king is already here. Maybe that process has already begun. I find that an exciting thought. It's possible. So, the day arrives. He's, he's finished the process of raising the dead, and now, now he's going to gather those who are alive and remain at his coming. So this is that day. That one. Is it a day that we anticipate? Is it a day you, you're hoping for, hoping for? Or, or is it a day we fear? Or a day we doubt? Or a day we need? Or a day we've forgotten about? Or a bit of all of those? A day yearned for passionately? earnestly, sometimes tearfully, but always confidently that he which began the good work in us, in me and in you, will complete that work perfectly, ready for this very day, this very hour, the moment. What's it like, the moment? Is it an unusually calm spring day in Adelaide? A turbulent night with a full, full moon. Is it just another day on the way into the office? And looking back, does the day feel different? Did it feel different? Did the birds somehow seem to know? Or was it just the same as every other day? Is there a crisp knock at the door? Or did they just appear in the room where we were? Is it a voice from the back when we're all here together? Or is it an opening in the crowd as we rush across North Terrace? And there he is. Who is? Who's going to come to bring us to him? We're not told. But there's a couple of obvious options that present themselves in the Bible. Perhaps it's someone who we knew and we loved. Maybe it's someone we stood at their graveside. We, we saw their coffin lowered, threw rosemary down as the sand fell. And yet, today, instead of the Amazon order we were expecting, them. There's precedent for this. And you'll note what it says there. It doesn't say that the resurrection happened at the time he was crucified. No, they came out of their graves after his resurrection and went into the city and appeared unto many. So maybe, maybe it's that. Or, or will it be an angel? Perhaps a, a face that... When we see for the first time, we're just certain. We've seen that face before, but we can't quite place it. It's kind of been at the edge of our vision our whole life. 
Will that, that one be the one? Will, we, will they be snatching our hand as we rush for the bus? There is precedent for that too. Lot escaping a world that needed to be destroyed and the angels came in and grabbed his daughters by the hand and pulled them from the city. There's precedent for that too. Rescued by angels. Now, how are we going to get there from here? Chartered jumbos? Snatched away. In other words, that there's an abruptness to our departure. The, the house is empty, yet the front door is unlocked and, and there's a cup of tea still cooling on the bench. The air conditioner is still running. And again, there is precedent for that. There's Enoch and there's Elijah and, and there's Philip. Middle of a preaching effort. He's just baptised the Ethiopian eunuch and he's gone. Oh, I'm at Azotus. How did that happen? Or even the disciples, immediately they were at the other side. There's precedent. And where are we caught to? Where is this all going to happen? Meeting the angels and, and, and the, the resurrected ones and, and the judgment seat and all of that. Where's that going to happen? Where, where, in fact, has our king returned to? To which both the lately late and the living are going to be collected. Where is that? And again, there's no explicit answer in Scripture. And yet several of the prophets saw snapshots of this time. And we can correlate what they saw. And, and based on that, we can infer the location of our groom's return and our destination. Come across to Deuteronomy 33. Please. Remember my manners. My mum's here. Deuteronomy 33. Now, Deuteronomy 33 is unquestionably a vision of a day future to Moses. He's blessing the nation that he had led through the wilderness. And like all of the blessings of, of the great fathers of old, it's, it's a blessing inspired by God that pictures the ultimate blessing, the kingdom of God. Verse 3, he, he talks about the saints. Yea, he loved the people all his saints are in thy hand. Important language. Verse 8, he says, And of the Le of Levi, he said, Let thy thummim and thy urim be with thy holy one. Who is that holy one? Verse 12, And of Benjamin, he said, The beloved of the Lord will dwell in safety by him. Who is that beloved of the Lord? Verse 19, over the page, and they shall call the people unto the mountain. What is that mountain that the people are called unto? What is this mountain that the people of, of righteousness are going to offer sacrifices of righteousness? Verse 28. Israel then will dwell safely alone. The fountain of Jacob shall be upon a land of corn and wine and the heavens will drop. This is kingdom language, isn't it? We know it when we read it. And verse 2, verse 2, he says, And he said, The Lord came from Sinai. He rose up from Seir unto them, shining forth from Mount Paran, and he came with ten thousand. Thousand of his saints from his right hand went to fiery law for them. And, and the important thing to understand when we read this verse is that historically God had come to Sinai. When some had witnessed God, well, when had anyone witnessed God come from Sinai? You think, well, what's he saying? Surely everyone witnessed him come from Sinai. No, no. 
the children of Israel witnessed him go from Sinai. Because they were with him. They saw him going, leading the way. And there went that, that amazing pillar of fire in front of him. There goes Yahweh. And they were behind him. But they'd never seen him come from Sinai because that implied they were somewhere else at that moment. Watching him come towards them. That had never happened. Never. The observer has to be somewhere else. That This is all future. And, and this, this vision is enlarged in the Psalms. Here in the Psalms, David, not Moses now, says the chariots of God are 20,000. The language is so similar. Even thousands of angels. The Lord is among them as in Sinai in the holy place. And again, couched in the imagery of the escape from Egypt is a vision of our future. And and just in case we're not sure, have a look at this. I've just extended the verse down a little bit. Verse 22 goes on to say in Psalm 68, the Lord said, I will bring again from Bashan. I will bring my people again from the depths of the sea. And and remember that thought because we're coming back in a few studies time, next study. Again, and so again, a prophet saw the the forces of God at Sinai. But I think it's Habakkuk, at least for me, who, who really helps us confirm this inference. Habakkuk 3 and verse 3, God came from Timan, means the south. And the Holy One from Mount Paran, a name for a mountain, just in that same vicinity as Sinai. His glory covered the heavens and the earth was full of His praise. And Habakkuk 3, most of it, all of it, is a song of the kingdom. The Septuagint says for these verses, it says, God shall come from Timan, the Holy One from the dark, shady Mount Paran. And notice the future tense. He will come, not has come, will The visions of of David and of Moses and of Habakkuk, they all picture a future time when God's presence is seen emerging from the region of Sinai with thousands of saints. That's the first time anyone sees him. Well, other than us. Oh, in case we're not quite sure yet, when Deuteronomy 33 was written, and Moses said that he saw the Lord come from Sinai to them, Moses was hundreds of kilometres north in Moab. When did God go to Moab? And come towards Moses in Moab. It's future. It's yet to happen. And that makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, intuitively, we know that makes sense. At Sinai, God proved natural Israel. And it will be there that he forges his spiritual counterpart. There in the austere grandeur, that grand theatre, remote and private, chosen as the place of the formation of God's holy people, his peculiar treasure in the day when he makes up his jewels. It happens there. Now, just in case you you have taken my free pass to heart, um, I'm going to try and make sure that with these studies, as we go through, there's a key so that as you drift down and think, oh, oh, we're back, uh, you can follow along. And you'll see in the bottom, what is that? One corner, I can't do rights and lefts at the best of time. There's going to be a little icon on just about every slide and that icon will line up with something on this page and you can find your place again. So right now, we're still in the gathering of the living. And we've kind of bounced around for the last few minutes through the gathering of the living and the immortality. Well, we haven't got there yet, but, but you can follow along by following those icons. And if you get lost... That should guide you back. All right. So here we are. We're at Sinai. 
And I'm, I'm not going to go through the process and basis of judgment today, in part because it's not something that we can, we can meaningfully address in the time that we've got. But I do want to mention one thing. Romans 8 is, oh, there's, there's lots of people for whom it's, it's a favourite passage. And Romans 8 tells us that God is for us. It's a courtroom scene, isn't it? And there's, there's this courtroom scene and we're in the dock. We're being judged. And the apostle says, well, we're in trouble because God, God's the one bringing the case. Ah, oh, but no. What shall we say to these things? God is for us. And if he's for us, who can be against us? We know he's for us because he did not spare his only begotten son, but he delivered Jesus up for us all, our Lord, our King. And if he did that, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? How can anyone bring a charge against us if God is actually justifying us? That's the argument. And, and we could go through it in more detail. But we're being told God is for us. The God who, before he began making this planet, already knew your name. And he'd already found out whether your name was written in the book of life unblotted right at the end. He already knew. And so, so why does he judge us? I mean, if he already knows and the decision is already made, why not just not pick up the ones who don't get in? That would be the easiest solution, right? Just leave them behind. But you see, the, the judgment serves a purpose. And the purpose, I believe, is this, that there will be some who, if they were judged before the judgment process, would actually be rejected. But the judgment, ser per the judgment process serves a purpose, not for God so much as for us. In other words, that, that process of reflection, aided by the recall of the book of lives from heaven's library, changes us, it guides us, it perfects us, it completes us so that we can stand, yes, chastened, but trusting to hear the words we long to hear from the one we know loves us and died for us. That's all I want to say in the judgment. I want to say, let's not live in fear of judgment, but instead strive as those who are grateful to have the living God on their side, to show him every day how awestruck we are of his gift in thankfulness because we know we have a living God. And so we bow before our Lord and we confess and in just a blink, the twinkling of an eye, we are different. We are re-energized, we are remade a new woman or a new man, but now made like the stars, eternal, immortal. And by the way, they're different things. Powered by the fire of an infinite God around which this whole universe revolves and spins. And that power now flows in our veins because he's gifted it to us. And that moment, right then, That moment is when our real life begins.
young people, you're going to meet people who say, Friday night, seriously, get a life. And that's exactly what we are doing. When someone says to you, you got no life, dead right. Because it's still coming when Christ, who is our life, shall appear. That's what we're waiting for. And then, then it all starts. And so we stand as newly minted immortals. We met him. We met our beloved. We felt his touch. He smiled and we cried and then smiled and then laughed. And we arose to newness of our real life. And so now, now we can look beyond the judgment to our future and to what happens next. So as we start to wind down, I want to suggest a timeline. Timeline that will allow us to frame the events of our future. Come across to Ezekiel chapter 40, please. Ezekiel chapter 40 and verse 2. Where it says, In the visions of God brought he me into the land of Israel and he set me upon a very high mountain by which was as the frame of a city on the south. This is the beginning of the vision that we know as Ezekiel's temple. It wasn't Ezekiel's temple, of course. It's Christ's temple. It's God's temple above all. But Ezekiel was gifted with the vision of it and he told us about it. And so he visits this temple, but but he visits the temple of the future age. And in verse 1, Ezekiel dates this vision. The vision of of the opening of the temple of glory. And he he dates the moment when when he goes to that temple and he sees the glory of God entering by the way of the east. And in in verse 1, it's it's very precise. It's very, very precise. Pardon me, I've got a little too far. He gives us not one date, but I don't know if you notice that. There's two. In the 5 and 20th year of our captivity, in the beginning of the year, In the 10th day of the month, in the 14th year. Huh? 25th and 14th. Which one? And the answer is, of course, both. Both dates are important. But he's being very precise. He doesn't want us to get the date wrong. He's giving us not one date, but two. He dates this vision both by the years of the captivity and then then adds the second date for us. This time from the final end of the kings of Judah and their kingdom. Two dates. Now, often when we see this, this sort of apparently redundant detail, apparently, it kind of serves as a, as a marker, as a sign or a flag from the Father that, oh, I heard this recently, I thought it was a great quote. It kind of says, dig here. When you see this sort of thing, you think, that, that was, he didn't need to say that, did he? It's, it's God's way of saying, have a look a bit deeper. There's something, there's something here. And if we dig in this particular date range, we find that exactly, exactly 49 years, six months and 10 days earlier had been Josiah's great Passover. Or if we reverse that round the other way, 49 years and six 
four months after the most significant event in Josiah's reign, and then 10 days more into the seventh month, in vision, the temple opened. Now, this interval of time matters. It's an important interval of time. Lots of you all know why I'm saying this. This this is a really important interval of time because, you see, these two events are separated by a jubilee period, a very precise period of time of 49 years, seven months, 10 days. Six months completed and then 10 days more. It's a jubilee period between these two days. And you think, well, okay, fair enough, neat, ha, huh, good. Well done. Go to the top of the class, you can do maths. But what we're being told is, well, we're kind of being hinted at and told that, that Josiah's Passover fell on a jubilee. In other words, Ezekiel was hinting that almost 50 years before the temple opens, the trumpet is blown. That's what happened in a jubilee. The trumpet is blown and the slaves were freed and the inheritance was returned and everything went back to the way it always should have been. 50 years earlier, almost. And what I'm suggesting here is that we're being told by Ezekiel that there are 50 years from our beloved's return to the opening of God's temple and the the commencement of the king's reign of peace over the whole earth. And this is in part supported by passages like this one in in Micah that, that suggests that 40 years of those 50 years will be occupied with saving natural Israel. It'll be just like the wilderness wanderings, he's saying. It's going to happen all over again. I've got 40 years to save natural Israel before the opening of the temple. Well, you kind of need 40 years or more and, and 50 years fits, doesn't it? 50 years is going to be occupied partly with saving natural Israel. But as you can see on your chart, we've, le- we've left 10 years. 10 years for the return and for judgment and Armageddon and everything else. And yes, we might have put it in the right place, wrong place, and there might be slightly different ways to arrange it. That seems like the guidance Ezekiel was giving us, it's it's about that long. One other supportive fact, by the way, there were 50 days between the Feast of First Fruits, when God's harvest is first reaped, and Pentecost, when harvest end is celebrated. 50 days. 50 days from the point where the Chaff of the summer threshing, uh, 50 days, pardon me, till the chaff of the summer threshing floor is finally completely blown away. 50 years till all the conflict is ended and the Prince of Peace reigns. So here we are. Perhaps as many as 10 years have elapsed since you felt that, that firm grip capture your hand, snatch you away. And here we are, we are now in the company of saints. We are saints. And outside, this community, this congregation, this vast ecclesia hidden in the wilderness, the drums of war are beating loudly. Each hour, angels arrive back at this community, fresh with news from their posts in the cities of power and influence. The rejected, they have re-entered the world at large and yet strangely, no doctors were able to detect signs of resurrection in its sufferers. For a hot minute, the the judgment day mass hallucination was was front page news and, and old news soon after. And now with further declarations of various statesmen and dictators, of disapproval of the Jewish state and treaties binding Europe and Russia together militarily, accelerating impacts of global warming, shattering confidence in the financial systems of the globe and the raucous voices of a thousand protest movements pummeling the remaining democratic governments. The world is a hair's breadth from midnight. And tomorrow, 
well, not tomorrow, but tomorrow at 3 p.m., the minute hand is going to hit 12 as we consider that subject. World War Three, if you like, Armageddon, and the end of all things as presently constituted will be nigh at hand. Well, no, not nigh, now. So, can you see yourself there? Can you picture the moment we are called and summoned away? Or, or can you imagine getting there and witnessing some of those, some of those reunifications, those meetings after so long? A loved one, perhaps? You want to meet again? A parent? Missed? A mentor? Or maybe the one who first called you and is gone now, returned from the grave in that day? Or perhaps it was the person who time ran out before you had a chance to say sorry. I've got one of those. Them. There'll be some, some reunions that are best conducted alone. And yet, tell you what, I would love to see David's, I'd love to be a fly on the wall in David's reunion with Uriah. Wouldn't you? What's he going to say? Or... Can you imagine hearing Paul between sobs telling Stephen that his whole life he'd carried Stephen's memory. He'd suffered so much for Christ's sake because, because Stephen, can you imagine? Last time Stephen saw this man, he was, he was the one with the rocks. Can you imagine seeing Jacob reunited with his, his true love? After a life of heartbreak, he gets to see her. Them. Or can you imagine seeing Samson's look of joy and wonder and surprise at his acceptance? Or perhaps most of all, there's one we are longing and still apprehensive of meeting isn't there him our beloved our groom it's weird to say that isn't it because we've never met him and so brothers and sisters I, I hope that this serves to put hope in our hearts and dream in our heads so that we can run to meet him